The book of Revelation is often approached from the standpoint, what's happening next? Uh, what about all these judgments and like what we just saw here now, the seals and um, the lamb who was slain and all these images that that come up through the book. And uh, a lot of people say, who's the Antichrist? What's the mark of the beast? Uh, what's happening next? What's happening next? And when we take that approach, we actually miss the very main purpose of the book. Because the main purpose of the book is relationship. How you understand God, how you experience him, and how you experience each other in, in light of that. And so this morning I'm going to uh, talk to you about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the three persons of the Trinity are portrayed in the book of Revelation. I'll only be able to scratch the surface. And uh, I might move a little bit fast, so don't worry about it. We are going to get these notes out eventually, and you'll be able to uh, uh, research the, the, the scriptures that I give. So we're going to start with Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. And <clears throat> uh, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. So we have three persons here. Uh, God the Father, who is identified as being eternal, who was, who is, and is to come. Jesus is also portrayed that way in the New Testament, or in the book of Revelation. So here is the eternal God. And so he wants us to know that he is just that. He's eternal. And uh, he nevertheless uh, reaches out to us, for relationship. He wants us to know who he is, and that's why he the book begins this way. And then it says, from the seven spirits before the throne. I'm going to be talking about that this morning, uh, probably at more length than, than about the Father and the Son. Seven Holy Spirits? Huh? Well, say what? <laughs> well, well, we'll explore that. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. So when he attests to something or says something, it's not speculative. Does he really mean it? Is this really truly from God? No, he's a faithful witness. He's faithful both in the content of the witness and he's faithful in delivering the witness. He's also the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Well, uh, just a quick look at those verses. Uh, grace and peace to you. Grace comes before peace. Uh, we're looking for peace in this world. It's never going to be achieved until we know the grace of God. You're looking for peace in your life. Um, answer to all the turmoil, the doubts, the fears, whatever you might be going through. It doesn't start with addressing those. It starts with understanding and receiving the grace of God. Um, he loved us. It says, um, and uh, to him who loved us, he loved us, uh, and, and it, he loved us, and he still does. So the, the whole essence of the book is a, it's really a, a love letter. It's a love reach out to all of us, a love reach out to you this morning. And so it, it's just like, well, love, and uh, it, it's how do you how do you describe it, the the love of He who was and is and is to come and the seven spirits and Jesus who was who died and He rose again. Uh, together they love us, and so the purpose of the book is more about that for sure than finding out what's going to happen. Um. And Jesus, who washed us, washed us is an Old Testament term that means to take away the things that are not pure within us. By his blood, a central theme of the Bible, the blood of Jesus. And he has made us kings and priests. So here is our identity. Here is who we really are and how we function. So out of the relationship flows function. Um, 
we are kings and priests because he loved us and he washed us by his blood and because the seven spirits that go through the earth are here and 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 the father uh, the son holy spirit he loved us and so our identity flows out, out from that and it's not just some small little servitude identity it's not some little secondary thing we try to find our identity in the world uh, through many many ways but there is no identity that is really the greatest or the the impact of what your identity can be to you and how you function in that than to know you're a king. You didn't say you're a prince or a princess, although we have a princess here this morning. Um, a king or a princess, you're a, a, a prince or a princess, you're a king. That's a pretty good position to be in. And, and yet at the same time, you're a priest. God said you are a priest. He's made us kings and priests. And so it, it just is really quite, quite amazing. So I'm going to go through the way that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are revealed to us in the book of Revelation. I'm going to have to go quickly, and I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface. But I'm going to start with the Father. And throughout the book of Revelation, you'll find he's referred to as the one who sits on the throne. I'm just going to give one verse, but in the notes there will be several that are made available to you. In chapter 4, verse 3, he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, this is John, and behold, a throne sat in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So here is the Father. He sits on the throne. And then uh, the second thing about the Father is he is the creator of everything and summons worship. It's not so much a summons or requirement. It's just a, an automatic, spontaneous thing from those who really understand who he is. In Revelation 4, verses 9 to 11, whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives for and ever, forever and ever, uh, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne. Notice how often that's, that is uh, expressed in, the, in this book. And they worship him who lives forever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. So he's, the Father is, is revealed as the one who created all things. And by your will they exist and were created. So the Father hasn't given up on us. He hasn't given up on the world. The fact that the world is still here, in spite of all of the sin and corruption and evil, it, it's held together by the Father. And, and all of these here are, 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 the design is to cause us to understand who God is and how we relate to him. And, and the expressions of worthy, and they were so beautifully portrayed there in that, in that um, uh, video we saw just a few minutes ago. Now, Revelation chapter 11, verse 16 and 17 is, is an example of the expression, he lives forever, the eternal God. Um, and the four and twenty elders who sat before God on, on their throne fell on their face, faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who is to come. There's that, that expression again. Because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and all those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. So he's the one who lives forever, and he's, again, being revealed. Uh, these, there's an interplay between these uh, descriptions of who God is. Um, now, for the sake of time, I'll just give you a few more, um, more examples. Uh, in the, he's expressed in the book of Revelation as the father of Jesus Christ, the lamb. So here, 
Uh, is Jesus in his earthly capacity as a man? And he is fathered by the eternal father. Uh, he's called the God of heaven. He's the Lord of the earth. He's the Lord of the prophets. And so these are some expressions of the Father. The Father is very, very much a part of the book of Revelation. He's the one who is over all that is taking place. And in expressing himself that way, we come to understand that he is very much, very much in relationship with us through his Son and his, through his Spirit. So the Father. Now, in understanding relationship, this is the tough one. We can understand Jesus as our brother much more easier than we can understand God the Father. Uh, a lot of men have a difficult time becoming fathers or relating as fathers or relating to the fathers they had. And so our life experience in our families of origin often leave us short, leave us with a huge deficit as men. And so it's hard for us to become vulnerable and open and, and to just receive the kind of father love that God has for us. And for women, too. A father could mean so many things that are not healthy. It can be a father who's distant, who distant, who's doesn't care, uh, a father who's critical, a father who uh, perhaps is even abusive. There's so many ways that we, we grow up in this world, uh, whether we're men or women, teens, girls, teen boys or children, that can be challenging when it comes to us receiving a revelation of God as father because the paradigm that we're operating in is just, just not in sync. So <laughs> the purpose, one of the purposes, well, not just of the book of Revelation, but the whole Bible is to bring us into a relationship that is unlike something that we've learned to really trust fully. And that is the relationship of father. And there's not a, a dad here this morning that would say, you know, I've been a perfect father and I never made any mistakes. Or, No, it's, we're all very conscious, uh, if you're a dad, of, well, I wish I would have spent more time or I wouldn't have done this. Or, you, you know, we could easily go through those things. And, and we find ourselves comparing ourselves to the eternal father, the God who is perfect. And just as much as our children need a, a father who pours into our lives in the best possible way, so also do dads need that father, their eternal father. And so instead of saying, look, well, you know, as a human race, we've messed up and dads have messed up and my dad messed up or whatever, uh, we're, we're pulled from that and we're pulled into, through the book of Revelation, um, a love relationship with God the Father. And before you try to figure out anything else about the book of Revelation or all of the images and the pictures and the portraits of the future, this is the beginning point. This is the most important point. It's the most important thing of all, to know God the Father. And then equally important is to know Jesus the Son. And he is portrayed in so many different ways in the, new, in the book of Revelation. And I'm not going to give you scriptures. I'm just going to give you some, some points. One of the things you'll find is that he sits with God on the throne. Now, you'll never find Jesus sitting on the throne by himself. He, anytime he's there, he is there with the Father. Now, the Father sits there by himself on times, but Jesus is there by invitation. It, the one who sits on the throne is the eternal father. And we read that in that capacity, he judges with the father. He does not judge independently from the father. You'll see him revealed in the book of Revelation as Messiah, as, as the one who all the Old Testament pointed to. 
And now in the New Testament, we see him not in some earthly capacity, but a heavenly capacity that still impacts the earth. Messiah. He's revealed as the rewarder of overcomers. To him who overcomes, I will. And that that appears over and over in the New Testament, uh, in the book of Revelation. One of the most beautiful pictures is in the last chapter where Jesus provides light for the city of God. And uh, that's just really quite amazing. He's also referred to as the Son of God. He's, a refer, he's referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David. So the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the root and the offspring of David. Now that's an interesting phrase because the root means the one from whom David sprung. So it, it, David came from Jesus, but then he's also the offspring of David. So Jesus... David came from Jesus. Jesus came from David. How can that be? (laughs) Well, it's in his uh, earthly capacity as the son of man, son son of God come to this earth. He's the offspring of the woman in Revelation chapter 12. He's the man child. And uh, these are just some pictures. He's the lamb that was slain. He's the one who redeemed people to God from every nation by his blood. Wow. Uh, The Father and the Son in beautiful harmony together. uh, in, In a relationship that is eternal, both in sense of time, but also in the sense of nature. It's not a a temporary relationship. Uh, One of the things that Marlene and I talk about once in a while, and we don't do this with a whole lot of foreboding, but we we are climbing up there in age. And they say there's three ways you know that old age is climbing up on the blind side of you. And the first one of those ways you know is forgetfulness. And I forget what the other two are. But... (laughs) We are getting a little older, and so we think, well, what would happen if one of us were to die? How would the other, the other handle life? And I think, oh, Lord, please take me first, because I could not get along without Marlene. It just, then I think that's kind of a, kind of a selfish thing to say, because she says, I don't know how I'd get along without you. So, so we're, we're, it's not that we're in, into that all the time, but we think about that now when at one time we, it, it hardly ever occurred to us. But when it comes to the relationship of the God the Father, God the Son, there's never any discussion like that. There's never any discussion, well, what happens when one of us die? Because they are both he who was and is and is to come, the eternal God. And so it's a relationship that is indestructible. It can't be torn apart. They never get in an argument. They are in full and complete harmony with each other. It's an amazing revelation of God. Well, let's move now to the Holy Spirit. And here's where I want to spend a little more of my time this morning. Uh, We already read from uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, Grace to you and peace from him who who is and who was and is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And then it goes on and says, and from Jesus. The seven spirits who are before the throne. So you see in, in pictures in Revelation where Jesus is sitting on the throne with the Father, and then before the throne is the Holy Spirit. Well, why, he, why isn't he up there? And how come there are seven of them? Why isn't he sitting on the throne too? Well, we kind of get a little picture of that as we go along. And uh, in fact, there's a close relationship between uh, the seven spirits and uh, the seven stars. 
And uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, uh, of the seven churches and the eleven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Uh, And so here is this picture of Seven spirits, seven stars, seven golden candlesticks. The the stars are the messengers to the churches. The candlesticks are the churches. And, And these weren't talking about just seven historical churches. The number of seven means something complete. So it's the church of all time. And the seven spirits before the throne, connected to the seven angels and connected to the seven candlesticks. So here here we're starting to understand the function of Holy Spirit on the earth in terms of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, that having been ordained by the Father who sent him to this world. Um, Chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So he's writing to the church in Sardis. He doesn't reveal himself to the other six churches this way, but here he, it's the seven spirits of God. Now Sardis was a church that was dead. It had, it had no spiritual life whatsoever. And so here we have a, a picture of the Holy Spirit expressed in seven as seven spirits, and he's with the Son, with Jesus, and he's reaching out through the messengers of the church, which can be pastors or prophets, or um, uh, and not just pastors or prophets, but those who speak life into the church in a human capacity, the seven stars, which are the messengers to the church. And if the message is going to get through, it's going to need the Holy Spirit. So, Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 to 5. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 elders, and and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the thrones proceeded lightning, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So we read that scripture earlier in describing the Father. We read it again. The Son is here. And now here is the lamps of fire. Now back in the book of uh, Zechariah, we get a picture of what those fi- that what that means, but I, I won't get it into into that here. But here we have again the seven spirits of God. Now, so there's all this information, and uh, I'm not trying to overwhelm you with inspir with uh, well with inspiration, yes, but not information. Uh, the picture that emerges is that there's Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And they express themselves in, with different titles, with different names, and with different roles. And in the mix of all this amazing picture of God, Father, God, Son, God, Holy Spirit, is this thing called the church, the people of God, who are called to and can enjoy and experience all of this magnificence, all of this incredible revelation of God and and how he loves us and he's eternal and, and he gives us so much, pours into our lives in so many different ways. And so um, I'm going to take you back to the book of Isaiah. Because in the book of Isaiah, we get an understanding of what the seven spirits are, if you will. And so in chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah, it says, 
There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay, so the first part is referring to Jesus. And so is this. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So there's someone who's coming from the line of David. And, of course, that was Jesus. And the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him. And now we get a picture of what this sevenfold spirit is. First of all, it is the Spirit of the Lord. It's a Spirit of God resting upon him who is the second person in the Trinity, but not in his capacity as God, but in his capacity as the Lamb of God, the one who came to this world as, as a child in a manger and became a man and In that function, he became the lamb that was slain, who gave himself for us and washed us in his blood. So the Spirit of God is on everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus said, and everything that Jesus still says, because he is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1, verse 1. He is the living Word. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Who he is and what he does. That's why it's so... You can't read the Bible as a book, as a text, as some kind of a a thing you open up like an encyclopedia or some kind of a journal of information. Uh, no, it's the spirit, it has to be the Spirit of the Lord that reveals to you the, the Word who's in the book, and that's Jesus. And that's why Jesus said when he comes, he'll, he'll guide you into all truth because he'll talk about me. And so we, we have this, in the book of Revelation, we see all of this coming together. The seven spirits before the throne, the seven spirits in connection with the church. And, and why seven spirits? Well, here we get the definition of these seven spirits. The second part is he's the spirit of wisdom. Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is being able to take the knowledge and the understanding that we have and Fashion our lives according to it. Now, if your knowledge is messed up, or it's incomplete, or your understanding about that is really not a good understanding, then you're really not going to make wise choices, not in the fullest and completest sense of the word. And so wisdom, he's the spirit of the Lord, and he gives to us wisdom. Wow. The Bible says if you lack wisdom, and we all do, you can, you can ask God and he will give to you freely and he'll never scold you for your bad mistakes from the past. That's right in the book of James. Wow. So here we come into the relationship. How is that possible? Well, it's p- possible because Jesus is the lamb and he washed us with his blood. And he redeemed us from all nations and tribes. We, we live in a time whenever we're, we're trying to figure out, the world's trying to figure out all of this racism and, and stuff. And, and all you got to do is look at the book and find out there is no difference between black or white or whatever color or from whatever nationality. God doesn't see those differences because he's redeemed us from every tribe and every nation. And so we get these, these beautiful pictures of the wisdom of God and how it it causes us to think differently about our fellow man, how we think differently about God, how we don't live in fear of him, but we live in rejoicing of who he is and we celebrate uh, him, not because we've never made a mistake or we're worthy of him, but because of his blood, because he is the lamb. He took the scroll, that whole book of inheritance that was lost because of sin, and he broke and he and he entered through the breaking of each seal. He entered. He he accomplished every requirement, complete. Seven is a number of completion, and and he met every requirement of the law and of the justice and holiness of God to restore to the earth what was lost. 
And so this spirit of wisdom, how we live our lives based upon what Jesus has done for us and the Father who loved us and sent Jesus and who sits on the throne with his Son. And understanding, well, listen, you can get all kinds of information. You can sit in church for years and years and years. You can read the Bible. And, and, and it can just be words on a page. And, and you can get the knowledge that you need because of, well, yeah, I know this and I know that. I know all about the book of Daniel and Matthew and whatever other book. But do you understand what it's saying? Do you understand that it's calling you into life of wisdom based upon your relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? So, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding. That's three. Let's keep going. The Spirit of counsel. Um, Oh, do we ever need that? <laughs> do we need counsel sometimes? You can read all the, all you want in the book of the Bible, and you can understand things, and but you'll never have it all. He'll always be the finite human. He'll always be infinite, the eternal. And every once in a while, we just need to say, Lord, I, I, I just need some counsel here. And, 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 and so you say, I need to talk to Marlene. Well, that's a good idea. And she will give you the counsel of the Lord, trust me. Um, but uh, you really need to be open to counsel that's based upon wisdom and understanding that is to lead you into greater, to greater experiences of those things. It's not just about... Should I buy this house or shouldn't I buy this house? Should I do this? Should I do this? Um, I'm having trouble with the, with the kids and how. Well, yeah, well, you need help with all that, that too. But the spirit of counsel takes you much, much, much higher than that. One of the ways it works, I'm sure, is that sometimes we just need direction in our lives. What's the will of God for my life? How do I, I best discover all that God has for me, all that he's called me to do? And when you're young, how important that is, because there's so many callings. The Bible refers to them as trumpets. There's so many trumpets that are sounding, saying, follow me, follow me, follow me, and the world is full of them. But there's a certain sound, a certain trumpet. It's the trumpet of the Lord. And it calls you with a certain sound, the Bible says. So how do I experience the counsel of the Lord? Well, it's, it's an all-life-encompassing thing. And the spirit of might. Oh, God, I can't do it. I just don't have the strength. I, I'm just, I, I just... I, I can't, I can't seem to get over this, or I've got weakness in my body, I've got weakness, and I'm struggling with this, and whew, I, yeah, I get all, I get it all. I need wisdom and understanding and counsel, but I just can't do it. <laughs> but with Him you can. Because He is the Spirit of might. And with the might and the strength of the Father, the Son, distributed through the earth by the Holy Spirit, he, he sits at the throne waiting for the direction from Father and Son, and he administers that direction in the earth. That's why he doesn't sit on the throne. He's busy looking after us taking the messages and the power and the anointings from the throne and bringing them across the earth, bringing them right here this morning. He's the mighty God. He's the one who is all-powerful. 
He is the one who can solve the life's problems that you can't solve and I can't solve. He's the one who can bring a world out of a mess. And he's doing that. That's what the book of Revelation is about, partly. He's the spirit of knowledge. Okay. So what I'm seeing happening is not really the truth. What's all going on with this pandemic and with all of this information here and there and there and there? there, He he sorts out for me what is the absolute truth and what is just the truth known by men or supposed by men. He gives me truth, knowledge. And he gives me the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the anointing, the sevenfold spirit is all of those things. And, and when it says the fear of the Lord, it's not, it's not oh boy, I better be, better be careful. He's got my number. No, it's, it's the respect and the awe and the worship of Almighty God. It's just like there's nothing more important than pleasing him and serving him and giving my allegiance to him. Just a few points. I'm going to close. The Spirit of the Lord is the only means by which wisdom and understanding and knowledge can be found. You can't really get it anywhere else. All other sources of wisdom are either deficient or they are foolish. The Spirit of the Lord frees the church from carnal attachments to leaders and to every other thing. Do we live in a time when we've got spiritual leaders on some kind of a pedestal? Well, yes. Where people listen to or watch, well, this man's got 10,000 in his church. This guy got, so he must be the guy to listen to. And so we have this, this fascination with leadership fascination with anything that can ease so easily, even in the church, take the place of Jesus. <sighs> really listen to this one. It's only the Holy Spirit who can teach us to know and love God. You could say, oh, you know, Jesus said you lost your first love. He said that to the Ephesian church. And it's like, okay, so first love, well, what is that? Well, maybe I won't talk about that right now, but I think you can get a pretty good idea of what first love is. And, and it's, it's like we can lose it. So if we've lost it, how can it really be what it's supposed to be in the first place? Well, first love is not always perfect love. But the Holy Spirit can, make, can perfect our love and thereby perfect our relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit, and only the Spirit, can cause the church to be conformed to be like Jesus, to be transformed to be like him. The Holy Spirit of God unifies a very diverse people, (laughs) And, and truly, the church is diverse. Like people from all over the world. I used to think before I went to Hong Kong, when I was first asked to go there, I don't know anything about Chinese people. I really don't have any relationship with any Chinese person. And I thought, how can I go to Hong Kong and pastor a church when I don't know anything about Chinese people? And I, I remember I, I was in Hamilton and my mother was in, in Brantford. And we were planning to go to, by this time it had been decided we're going to Hong Kong. And I'm on a bus going to, it's only a 45 minute uh, bus ride. And I'm sitting beside a Chinese university student. And I said, I'm moving to Hong Kong. And she said, oh, wow, Uh, that's amazing. And she's going on about like this. And I said, I don't know anything about Chinese culture. I, I, I don't know that I've ever really had. Uh, lengthy conversations with a Chinese person. 
And so she said, oh, well. <laughs> and so she started talking and explaining. And, I, and so I thought, oh, you know what? Chinese people aren't hard to talk to. Uh, very friendly, very outgoing, not like, why would you be coming to our country? Nothing like that at all. And then when we got to Hong Kong and we, well, before we, we went there, we were interviewed. People came over from Hong Kong to meet with us in Toronto and, and, uh, we, we, we were embraced and loved and taken out to real Chinese food. We had never really had that before in our lives because we found out it's a lot different than what you get in Chinese restaurants typically in North America. And, and then we got to China and we started to just, well, we just found out, you know what? They really aren't any different than I am. In fact, there was one guy on the board. His name was Brutus. And we used to joke a lot together. And we stood up, I think it was on a Christmas party or something or whatever it was, and we said, you know what? We are brothers. And then he's quite a bit shorter than I am, and he's Chinese. And we looked at each other, and we had this rehearsed. You know what? I think we're identical twins. (laughs) And, of course, everybody laughed because there was no resemblance at all physically to each other, but there was a point to that. We really were. Our identity wasn't in the color of our skin or how our eyes are fixed into our sockets or our skulls or just his hair was black, everybody's hair was black. Uh, We come from a, you know, Caucasians can have any, any color of hair and hair that can change color. Um, you can laugh at that if you want. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is this. There really is no difference. And God takes diversity from nations, from tribes, he says, from men, from women, from rich, for poor, for kings, for paupers, for anyone. And he brings us into this unity that by human standards and efforts is impossible. And the history of the world proves that. That peace just not, does not come for, through human effort. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try to have peace in this world, but, but we're never going to accomplish it anywhere close to the degree that it happens through the power of God's Holy Spirit who administers all of the blessings of Jesus from the cross and from the Father who sent him to this world in the first place to redeem us to be his own special church, his own special people. And you can clap at that and give thanks to the Lord. Wow. I I hope this message hasn't been too technical. I, I hope that you did catch at least the spirit of it. And you'll grow in the spirit of the word that's been ministered this morning. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, throughout the church, uh, for Christians, for every Christian that's here, have you felt the Holy Spirit speak to you today? Just lift your hand. Yeah, okay. Now, whatever it is he's saying to you, will you listen and obey and follow? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I'm just going to ask you to respond in your own heart to the Lord about that. If there's someone here this morning, you'd say, I, I, I need to um, Give my life to Christ to become a follower of Jesus. I don't understand any, everything, especially all this stuff in the book of Revelation, but I, I, I do know that Jesus, that Jesus loves me and that he died for me. He died to forgive me of my sins and to cause me to know what life is, true life is. And what a a true future is. And I'd like to become a follower of Jesus this morning. Not just in knowledge in my head, but 
in my life experience. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Is there anybody like that? Okay. Lord, we take your word this morning. We take the message of the cross, the message of the Father, the message of Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just assimilate it into our lives as just humans. And we know we can only do that through the Spirit of God. And Lord, the revelation of the seven spirits for the, before the throne is overwhelming. We realize just how invested you are in our lives. Assigning those roles to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for making it possible. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here today your abiding presence in our lives every day. Thank you, Lord. So, worship team, would you come? And Tina, would you uh, lead us in a closing song? And and, uh, actually, you can close us in prayer as well. Why don't you stand? And uh, do you love Jesus this morning? Are you thankful for the Father? Do do you give thanks to the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come? And to Jesus who is worthy, worthy, oh, worthy are you, Lord. Worthy to be thanked and praised and worshipped. Are you there with me? We give thanks to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit who's present. Right here, right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.